and I really don't plan to, to preach long, but I do want to bring out from Ephesians 5 and 6 these final uh, applications to our, our church covenant um, about primarily um, working together to maintain a faithful gospel witness in our worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines. And as I said, this church at Ephesus actually in many ways was a model church. In fact, when you read about them in Revelation chapter 2, uh, you read where the Lord commends them because in many ways they did remain faithful to the gospel. They certainly had a major problem because they were doctrinally sound and they were sound in their discipline, but their devotion to Christ, they had lost that. But at this point when Paul writes this letter, it seems like this church was being pretty faithful with the gospel, although not, not without its problems. Like any church, it was a work in progress. It was established by the gospel. They were evangelizing, as, we saw, as I said in chapter 19. You read that from this church, the word of the Lord went out into all of Asia Minor, uh, modern-day Turkey. Um, the word of the Lord multiplied, it increased, and many people were, were converted. And yet, this church did have some problems, as we read in the opening verses of chapter 5. Paul has to remind them to be imitators of God as beloved children and to walk in love. And he, he talks about some serious, some serious sin in the church. He talks about sexual immorality and impurity and covetousness, that those things must not be named among them. Well, why would Paul say that unless that there was some kind of a problem with that? And so, this church was a great church, but it was not a perfect church. It was a work in progress, and Paul exhorts them that they need to remain working together to maintain a faithful gospel witness. In chapter 4, he had exhorted them to, to, to walk through this world in such a way that others would be pointed to, to God their Father. In, in chapter 5, he repeats that. He talks in chapter 4 about walking worthy of the calling to which they have been called. In other words, what Paul was saying in chapter 4 and again in chapter 5 about being imitators of God and walking in love, he was saying to them that he and God expects for them to maintain a faithful gospel witness in their lives, in their discipline, and in their doctrine, and in all that they do as a church. Now, the key to this, and this is what I want to really make, make clear this morning, the key to a church maintaining a faithful gospel witness is how they do corporate worship. And I say that because after these 17 verses exhorting them to live right, he then turns his attention to their corporate gathering. It sounds rather strange in verse 18. He says, and do not get drunk with wine, for, there is, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And what's the result of that? Well, you're addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. What Paul is describing here in verses 18 to 21 of chapter 5 is corporate worship. Paul says, and, and it sounds strange, well, why would he say don't be drunk with wine but be filled with the Spirit? Well, because you have to understand where the Ephesians were coming from. They were coming from a culture that there was a, a, the, the, the god of Bacchus, who was the god of wine, who was, who was worshipped in that city. And a part of their religious gathering was actually drunkenness where they would work themselves up into an intoxication where they would then become very, very wild in their gathering together. And so Paul is simply reminding them, you've been converted, you're, you're no longer doing that. And just as you were used to be controlled by alcohol, the wine in your worship, you're now to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Paul expected them to be very, very serious in their worship. And that involves uh, being, being of, of sound mind, being filled with the Spirit, being controlled by the Spirit, not being out of control, but rather under self-control. In fact, in chapter 5 of Galatians, Paul writes, the very last fruit of that bouquet of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So Paul's expecting them to take themselves in hand when they gather together and to be sober-minded and to be serious-minded and to consider one another in their worship. He says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. They are to speak, to sing, to communicate truth to one another. 
They are, in verse 20, to be giving thanks to God together. The, the gospel makes them grateful, and they are to be grateful together. Finally, in verse 21, they are to submit to one another in the fear of God. They're to show respect and honor to one another. The gospel humbles us and it harmonizes us. And to the degree that they do so, to such a degree, they will faithfully bear witness to the gospel in their worship, in the practice of the ordinances, and in their discipline of one another, and in their doctrine. I was reminded this week in an email I received from a pastor in the States that members of local churches are commanded to assemble regularly and to be a corporate display of God's glory to the world by preaching the gospel and making disciples. In other words, when we gather together, simply, we are to be gospel-centered. That we are to maintain a faithful gospel witness. When we gather together, it must all be grounded and centered on the gospel of God. It's interesting after Paul exhorts them, he's given all this doctrine in chapters 1 to 3, and then in chapter 4 he begins to apply this. He talks about their corporate worship in chapter 5, verses 18 to 21, and then he moves into how they're to behave in the home. And then in chapter 6, he moves into and verses um, 5 to, to 9, how they are to live, live out their gospel in the workplace. That Paul is simply saying there's a connection that how you worship together on the Lord's Day, how we worship together will have an effect on how we live in the home. And it will affect how we live in the workplace. In other words, if we are faithful to gather together to maintain the, a faithful gospel witness, if we, if we gather together to be faithful stewards of the gospel, to be gospel grounded, to always be reminded of the grace of God in the gospel, then the outflow of that should be when we go home, our homes are better off. And when we go to work, our workplace should be better off, that there is a shining light there. D does that make sense? There's a connection here. Church life and the rest of our life are connected. But of course, it's easier said than done to be able to live out the implications of the gospel, to live a life where we are thankful to God for everything, uh, to be able to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ that is very, very difficult, and Paul understood that. That's why after giving all these instructions in chapter 5, verses 1 to chapter 6, verse 9, he says in verse 10 of chapter 6, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Why? Because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In other words, Paul understands that if this church is going to be committed to be maintaining a faithful gospel wor wor uh, uh, witness in its, in its doctrine, in its discipline, in its ordinances, that that's not going to be easy. Because the evil one wants to destroy churches. The evil one is against us living gospel, faithful lives. Therefore, this is not something that we commit to do in our own flesh. And that's why our covenant actually concludes with this. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Why? Because we can't do this in the flesh. We need God's help to live out faithful church membership. Can I just say this to us as a congregation that each member is responsible to contribute to gospel-centered worship. Paul makes that very clear. When he says to be filled with the Spirit, and then he, and he lays responsibility upon the congregation, you are to address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Um, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to my mother, and she said, you know, I, I, I tuned in, uh, tune into your sermons, um, are, are on the, the broadcast that goes out. And she said, I missed last week. She said, but what, but what happened? She said, because you said that the week before was a disaster. And I said, no, no, Mom. I said, the context of that was when I got up, I said, Ed, our singer, our, our song leader, would you, would you please come up and sing, lead us and sing at the end of the service? Because last week I led it and it was a disaster. 
And she understood that because she raised me. <laughs> it's wonderful to have Ed's voice leading us in singing. And we have, who said amen? <laughs> it's wonderful to have that. But Ed's not singing to us primarily. He's helping us to sing to one another. He's helping us to corporately remind one another of the glorious gospel of God. Each of us is responsible to, to, to develop a thankful heart. We're responsible to participate um, meaningfully in a, in a thankful heart within the body of Christ. Each of us is responsible to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And can I just say this? As my wife often reminds me and reminds people who are struggling with submission, that submission is not we agree. Can I say that again? Submission is not that always that we agree. That's called agreement. We're called to submit to one another because we don't always agree, and therefore we respect one another and honor one another and lay our differences aside. And that's not easy to do. That's why we have to be filled with the Spirit to do that. But each member is responsible to participate meaningfully to help us to maintain a gospel-centeredness as we corporate worship. We don't show up as spectators. We show up as participants. Each church member, secondly, is responsible to participate meaningfully and righteously in the, in the ordinances as we commit to as a church. Baptism is essential for us to maintain a faithful gospel witness. And, and keep in mind, as we have tried to instruct over the years, that when we affirm someone's confession of faith and they are baptized and we confirm their profession of faith and we embrace them as members, we are taking responsibility to guard the gospel in this church. And here's what I mean by that. If, if somebody were to share a testimony and say, I, I, I believe that I am saved because I have done a lot of good works, and if we just ignored that and accepted that, are we being faithful to the gospel? No. But if someone gives a clear testimony that I've been saved by grace through faith in Christ alone, then we can affirm that and we're being faithful with the gospel. The same is true with the Lord's table, which we're going to uh, observe uh, momentarily. That what we're doing by, by fencing that table and saying this is only for baptized believers, this is only for those who are members of a local church or pursuing membership in a, local church, a biblical local church. What we're doing is we're simply trying to guard the gospel. We're not trying to make a lot of heavy rules. We're simply saying, as a church, we're a steward of the gospel, and we must maintain a faithful witness to that. Each member of BBC is responsible to uphold the, the discipline exercised by the congregation. Paul, in fact, when Jesus addressed this church in, in Revelation chapter 2, he com commends them for their discipline. He says, you have tried those who say they are um, apostles and are not. You have, you have been faithful to doctrine and you have been faithful in discipline. And he commends them for that. That's not all there is to church life. There's a huge part of devotion there that they were missing. But as a faithful church, they were uh, as being faithful to the gospel, they're exercising discipline. And finally, each member is responsible to protect the integrity of the gospel. When we commit as a congregation that we will work together to maintain a faithful gospel witness in all of these areas, each of us is responsible to guard the gospel. And when Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 1, in verses 6 to 9, he says to them, if anybody comes among you and preaches any other gospel than the one that I have preached, let him be accursed, let him be anathema. And Paul doesn't say that to the elders of the church only. He's writing a letter to the entire congregation and saying to the congregation, you're responsible to guard the gospel. Which means that if you have someone who is preaching to this congregation who's who's misrepresenting the gospel and denying the gospel as a congregation, you're to rise up against that. We are all responsible to maintain the integrity of the gospel. In fact, I would argue in chapter 6 of Ephesians, verses 10 to 17, putting on the whole armor of God, is, is Paul is writing that to the entire congregation, not just to the leaders, to the entire congregation, and he's saying you need to stand together for what? The truth of the gospel. So we need to be 
faithful to guard the gospel. Secondly, we commit in our covenant that we will contribute cheerfully to the expenses of the church, the needs of our neighbors, and the spread of the gospel around the world. Secondly, we want to address giving and the gospel. It's interesting when the, the members of the Ephesians church were, Ephesian church were converted, so was their worldview. And I've alluded to this already in previous sermons, but in chapter 19, these people who were worshipers of Diana, uh, particularly, they took all their, and, and some of those who were worshiping Bacchus, they took all their religious books, and they took, they took their idols, and they brought them, as it were, together, and they burned them. They were, it was a financial cost to following the Lord. They understood that when Jesus saved them, that when he converted them, he converted all of them. Their worldview was radically changed. We saw last week in chapter 4 and verse 28, Paul says to these Ephesian believers, if, if you have been formerly stealing, steal no more, but rather what? Labor, so you're going to have to give to those who are in need. In other words, Paul says, hey, before you were converted, it was all, for some of you, it was all about getting. It was all about taking. But now that you've been converted by this glorious gospel, now that you've been radically transformed, you need to see yourself as a giver, not as a getter. A giver, not as a taker. In chapter 5, he opens the chapter and reminding them of, of Christ who loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And Paul's expecting that they will live a life of sacrifice for others. It's interesting in Acts chapter 20 when Paul addresses the Ephesian elders the, the pastors of this church, he says to them, you remember, in verse 35, he says, you remember when I was with you, I taught you the words of Jesus, it is more blessed to what? Give than to receive. And he says, I've coveted no man's silver or gold. With these hands I have labored to, to meet needs, meet my own needs and to meet the needs of others. And Paul reminds them that as Christians, teach, as I taught your church in Ephesus, go back and teach them again, it's more blessed to give than to receive. In other words, it was expected that as this church grew in Christ's likeness, chapter 4, that so were their willingness to share with those who were in need, both physical need and spiritual need. And such a generous lifestyle would serve as a faithful gospel witness. We live in a world that's consumed with consumerism. It's all about us getting and us taking. We live in a world marked by the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. A world that is consumed with materialism and, and getting. But as Christians, we follow the example of our Savior who gave himself for us a sacrifice to God. We present our bodies, which I assume includes our bank accounts and our wallets, to God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. And therefore, as those who are members of a biblical church, we are willing to contribute cheerfully to the expenses of the church, the needs of our neighbors, and the spread of the gospel around the world. Why? Because of a love for God. When, when, when God promised a seed, a son, to, to, to Abraham, and he gave him Isaac, and, 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 and in chapter 22 of Genesis, it says, God comes to Isaac and he says, I want your son, your son whom you love. First time you find the word love in the Bible. And what does he do? He offers up Isaac as a sacrifice to God. Why was that? Because of a greater love. Because after he does that, God commends him and says, Abraham, don't do this. Now I know that what? You love me. Yeah, you love Isaac, but you love me more. Love makes us givers. We talk about doing this cheerfully. And when Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 12, he, 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 he exhorts them that God loves a cheerful giver. The, uh, the, the word there, the Greek word, is actually the word hilarious. We get our word hilarious from it. I've been in a lot of church services. I've never heard anybody, I've never seen anybody fall in the aisle laughing from giving. But the point is that we give not grudgingly, but cheerfully. BBC has a long history, a long history of cheerful, sacrificial giving. Long before I came here, this church was involved in church planting and, 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 and funding church planting and, and even other, the purchase of, of other church buildings. 
Um, this church has a long history of helping our own members as well as those outside of here. And long before COVID, our members have cared about one another and contributed cheerfully to the needs of fellow members. During COVID, it's been amazing to see the church come together and help people financially. Even this week, someone else said to me, hey, if you know of anybody in the church that has need, let me know. We want to contribute to that. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? And what drives that? What drives that is the gospel. And as we do that, that makes, it makes people scratch their heads. Why do you guys do that? Because of the gospel of God. It's a means of being a faithful witness to the gospel. The needs of the day-to-day functioning of, of BBC are cheerfully met. And the extension of the gospel has gone far and wide because of such cheerful, covenantal faithfulness. And we thank God for this. Last Sunday night when we voted to give away a, a large chunk of money to help others. What a blessing to be a part of that. It's all a part of being faithful to the gospel, being a faithful gospel witness. But thirdly, there is not only guarding the gospel and giving in the gospel, but there is going for the gospel. If you look at this clause that we added a couple of years ago, maybe, it says, if we leave this congregation, we will join another gospel preaching church. Notice that. We will join another gospel preaching church as soon as possible where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. When Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians, there was little choice amongst these believers of where they would be a member. I've often longed for that, that if you were in a town where you're the only church You'd have to be like the church at Ephesus. If you weren't happy, you'd either have to get happy or apostatize. And I say that kind of half facetiously. But by the grace of God, there are many faithful gospel churches in our city, in our our area. And sometimes people leave and go to other churches. Sometimes people are relocated and they go to another part of the country or another part of the world. And what this covenant expects is this, is that when you leave this gospel preaching church, that as soon as possible, you will go with the same gospel and join yourself to another local church that's faithful to the gospel. And and there's a real sense in which the only way we should ever leave a church is for the gospel's sake. We we, we leave because God God and his providence is moving us to another part of the world. But, but keep this in mind that God is not moving you to another part of the world because of your career. That's simply a means. If God is moving you, he's moving you so you can go and strengthen another local church with the gospel. God may move you because of uh, education and you have to go somewhere to, to study. That's fine, but keep in mind underneath all of that, God's greatest plan is to move you to go and, with this gospel and to strengthen others with the gospel. Sometimes God takes people out of a church to revitalize and strengthen uh, another church that's not doing so well with the gospel. The point is simply this, that we are making a commitment as we join this church and as members of this church, then we leave this church, we're not just going to sit at home. That we're going to make it a priority. And by the way, can I just say this and hope that people hear this in a right way. When, you, when you're going to move... The first thing you should be looking for is, where am I going to plant my church membership? It is so important. Local church is so important for you and for your family. I was in touch with someone this week from another church who was asking advice about leaving a church. And he made the comment. He said, said, I really feel like, for the sake of my family, I need to find a church that is is faithful. And I think that 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 is wise. We go, if we go, we are going for the gospel. And finally, grace in the gospel. I've already read the closing statement. Let me read it again. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Becoming a member of a local church is not like joining the Lions Club or the Kiwanis, or any other merely human social organization. Because to live faithfully and fruitfully as a church member requires supernatural ability. 
And the final clause of our covenant is actually lifted from 2 Corinthians 13, 14, pretty much verbatim. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. This is the most biblical statement we have in this covenant. And it's essential. When, when Paul actually ended that letter to the 2 Corinthians, you've got to remember the context of that letter. The context of that letter was Paul was under an immense assault and he had to defend his ministry. And Paul has, has some hard things to say, both for him personally and for them to hear. But at the end of that, he's, he's pulling them all together and saying, listen, though there's some serious problems in the church, we need to recognize that your church is a work, or this church is a church in, in progress, it's a work in progress. And this church can go forward as long as we have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. That as we have those gifts from God, we can go forward. That God is able to make all grace abound towards us so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, we as a church may abound in every good work. As Paul ends chapter 3 talking about that what their prayer, his prayer for them and our prayer for one another should be about knowing the, the breadth and the length and the, and the height and the depth of the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that would be filled with the fullness of God. That as we pray that, we think that seems so impossible. But Paul doesn't leave us there in verses 20 to 21. He says, listen, our God is able to do far more abundantly than anything you ask or think. By the power that works within us by his grace and by his love and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And my point is simply this. The key to that is this. By keeping the gospel as the main thing, then our church is empowered by the love of God and the grace of God and by the fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God. And in a world that is darkened in their understanding when it comes to God, in a world that is dark with depravity and decadence and demise, we are to shine as bright lights, as Paul says in Ephesians 5, 18 to 14. We are to shine brightly and we're to do that together in a covenant relationship. So may God grant us the grace to not merely say this covenant, but to stick to this covenant. By God's love, may we be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, and by communion with God, may we remain in close fellowship one with another, growing in godliness, doing much good in the world, bringing glory to God. Just as I close, let me say this. That God has given to the church, as we saw a week or two ago in chapter 4, God has given to the church gifted men to help our church to be, make progress as a work in progress. And this morning we are going to be, in a few moments, uh, appointing uh, three, uh, other, two other elders. Uh, Quinn, next week, he's uh, was already had it scheduled to be away this weekend. We're going to appoint two more elders today. And we're going to appoint Jilu as a deacon. Those are all gifts from God to help us to fulfill this covenant. May God give us grace to do just that. Let's pray. <clears throat> God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for the church that came out of his bleeding side. Thank you for this church. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done in this church through the years, all you have brought it through. And I pray, Lord, for decades to come, Lord, that you would help Brackenhurst Baptist Church to, to guard the gospel, to sacrificially give because of the gospel, to go because of the gospel, and to be empowered by the grace of the gospel. And we pray, Lord, for your protection of this church. And I pray you'd help us to be strong in the Lord and the power of your might. And Lord, may this church for generations continue to maintain a faithful gospel witness.
in its ordinances, in its discipline, and in its doctrine. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.